Okay, good morning everyone. Um, welcome to the first talk today of IWQC, the International Workshop on Quantum Compilation. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Errol Campbell, who is known to very many of you for his work on quantum error correction and quantum simulations. And um, he is a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield and has recently joined the newly established uh, Amazon Center for Quantum Computing. So Errol's gonna talk about random quantum circuits and their uses in compilation, and I'll turn over to Errol now. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Ross. Thanks for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. So I'm gonna tell you, it's, I'm kind of gonna give a bit of a survey talk on random circuits. So I thought I'd do a survey talk because it's kind of the first uh, session of the meeting on compilation. And also there's kind of an interesting history here, so I was gonna run us through that. But all of the work that I'm gonna present of my own which is going to be mixed in with other people's work, was done at Sheffield. And um, any work that I did at Sheffield was in collaboration with Ian Kai, Yu Yang and David White, whilst um, they were postdocs in my group. So since then, as Ross said, I've uh, joined AWS Quantum, but I won't be talking about any of that work today. Oh. Okay, so very briefly, because I guess anyone that's listened to this conference knows what compilation is. It's the idea that you want to uh, kind of compress the number of gates that you have in some algorithms. You want to take some large, messy code for a quantum algorithm and you want to compress it down. It's something that's smaller and leaner and meaner. And I guess most people, when they think about compilation, will think about some deterministic process where you put something in and you get something definite out. But the question I want to ask in this talk is, can randomization help? So by randomization, I mean some series of coin tosses that you make in the algorithm where you decide to do one gate or a different gate depending on the outcome of that coin toss. And uh, so for instance, every time you run the algorithm, it might run a different actual sequence of gates. And as I said, it's gonna be a um, <clears throat> kind of historical overview talk in some regards. I'm gonna bring us through the many eras of quantum compilation, starting from way back in antiquity, when all we had was the solovay type theorem. And then there's this kind of like period that I almost call the dark ages, <clears throat> sorry, a bit of a sore throat, almost called the Dark Ages, but decided that wasn't quite fair, so called it the Middle Ages. So this is an era where there wasn't a huge number of new results, and lots of it was kind of working out the details of Solovay's Hive. But then there's this period that many people refer to as the Renaissance in quantum compilation. You often refer, see it referred to that um, as the Renaissance in the introduction papers. And uh, I guess the key thing that changed here is that people started to focus on specific gate sets like Clifford plus T, and they started to use insights from number theory in order to design better compilers. So here I'm just going to highlight three interesting papers from this period. But I feel like something has kind of fundamentally changed since this Renaissance period. Now there's this huge explosion in the field. There's whole conferences dedicated to this topic. Um, there's many different directions that the field is going in, including lots of software platforms being developed and lots of software tools which weren't previously there, and also many different theory results. So in this kind of early industrial period over here, um, hopefully you can see my mind, my mouse. Um, from this point onwards, I kind of really specialize into a subtopic of random compilation. I'm gonna give you a kind of slightly biased survey. Oh, uh, hang on. Okay. A slightly biased survey, starting off with some work that I did, which uh, there was similar work by Hastings around the same time, on the very general idea of how you use randomization to help you in compiling. And then there's kind of a series of papers that look specifically at Hamiltonian simulation and how randomization can help with that, with that particular problem. And then I'm gonna finish off by just telling you about a recent paper from Caltech. So again, these, these two papers are ones that were not inside my group. And so this last paper is actually looking at the idea of de-randomization. What happens if you take a randomized compiler and then just look at one instance of it? What can you say about the performance of that individual instance? Okay, so starting with the review material. So a gate set, the kind of instruction set that we build our compilation out of, our, um, our circuit out of, is G. So it might contain some elements A, B, and C. And we build up circuits through sequences of these things. So words built out of this alphabet of gates. And roughly we say a gate set's universal if it can implement any unitary up to some finite precision. But more precisely, what we mean when we say a gate set is universal is if for any target unitary V, any, any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a finite length circuit 
built out of elements of our gate set, so some sequence of um, some sequence of gates forming a word, such that uh, the distance between this u, which we know how to implement, and v is smaller than the target position. So an example of a universal gate set is Clifford plus T or Clifford plus Toffley. I imagine many of you know what that means, and I, uh, I'll be recapping it later on if that isn't clear. So we also have to associate a cost model with the gate set. So uh, if I have a circuit that's built out of different GIs that are from the gate set, then I say the cost of the whole circuit is just the sum of the costs of the individual gates. And there are a couple of different cost models you can imagine using the uniform cost model where you just say everything inside the elementary gate set has unit cost, or let's say the magic state cost model, t count cost model, where the T gates have unit cost and the Clifford gates have no cost because um, in fault tolerant quantum computing, these require some magic state preparation, so much, much more expensive. So this is a fairly good approximation to the real cost model. Okay, so then a uh, unitary compiler, uh, I'm going to say, is some kind of black box software with something going on inside that takes as input the target unitary, takes as input some precision epsilon, and then gives you some sequence of gates that are inside your gate set that meets um, this particular promise with respect to the error, but also your black box compiler might have some promise that comes with it that tells you that the cost of this particular unitary is less than or equal to some function of epsilon. So we'd say that a compiler is, effi is efficient if this, uh, this function of epsilon is some polylogarithmic function. So it's less than some constant plus logarithm of one over epsilon to some power gamma that's gonna be really important. And the optimal compiler is the one that achieves the lowest possible cost or the lowest possible promise f of epsilon. So kind of maybe surprisingly, very early on, it was found out that any gate set that was universal is not just universal, but efficient. So this was proved by the solovey kataev theorem. And I believe there's a paper by Kataev that I've not read and some kind of email claim by Solovey stating this. And this says that for any gate set, um, which it, yeah, so for any gate set which contains its own inverses, and um, with a uniform cost model, there exists an algorithm that can solve the problem where the cost is always bounded by some big O logarithm, one of epsilon to some power gamma. And I believe that they were a bit vague about an exact value of gamma saying it was somewhere between three and four, and that the runtime is efficient in some variables. So it's efficient in log one over epsilon, and it's efficient in the Hilbert space dimension, but this algorithm does require multiplying matrices together. And so as the Hilbert space dimension gets larger, it's going to become impractical because the matrices are going to be too large to multiply together. But one can hope to use all of at kind of modest size, um, for modest size problems. But an important question is, what is the constant gamma? And so uh, in this kind of middle era where people were working out the details of the very fundamentals of gate combination and solovey Tayev, there are a couple of interesting things that you can look at on this, including Aram Harris. Uh, bachelor's thesis, I believe it was, and also this nice review paper by Dawson and Nielsen. And in both of these works, they explicitly say, they give an explicit description of Solovega's hive and show that this exponent here in the cost is 3.97. And there's some constant prefactor, which is going to naturally grow with the size of the Hilbert space. So a natural question you might ask is, is Solovega's hive optimal? And the answer is no. And in fact, that was also proved very, very early on. All the way back in 2002, Harrow, Recht, and Chuang showed that if you have any uh, universal gate set with a uniform cost, then there's going to exist, there exists a solution to the compiling problem with a cost that's less than some function of log one over epsilon. So um, the gamma value here, there's no gamma because it's equal to one. And they can show that up to constant prefactors, this is optimal. So there's no constructive algorithm given here, unless you mean by constructive algorithm, just search through every possible circuit that you could imagine implementing and check what the cost of each of them is and then choose the best one. And essentially that's how the proof goes. It basically kind of um, describes all possible words that you could build out of your elementary gates and shows that there's at least one of them that has the desired precision, but it doesn't tell you how to find it other than just scanning through everything. So even in this kind of very early period of the field, you have these two results in tension, that we know that it's theoretically possible to do gate synthesis in a way, in a way that um, depends on the target precision epsilon, 
only in terms of log one over epsilon. Whereas Solovic Atayev and these other related papers tell us that you can practice what you can practically achieve, at least for kind of modest Hilbert space dimension, is um, a number of gates that scales like log one over epsilon to the power of 3.97. So there's quite a big gap between these two scalings. And it wasn't clear how to close this gap. And indeed, for a long time, the field was kind of frozen in that state where um, there was just a quite large gap between what we knew was optimally achievable and what we could kind of reasonably achieve with Solovic and Tayev. And then we have this period that I'm calling the Renaissance. And I suppose the key thing that changed here is that people really started focusing not on arbitrary gate sets, but on a specific gate set, so Clifford plus T. And the, the reason for focusing on Clifford plus T is that it's really the important gate set for fault tolerant quantum computation because there's this group, which is the Clifford group, which includes or is generated by gates including the C-NOT gate, the S-gate, and the Hadamard gate. And um, in fault tolerant quantum computing, often the Clifford group is fairly easy to realize through transversal gates or lattice surgery. And so it's fairly reasonable to assign a cost of zero to those gates. But the T-gate is a bit harder to implement, but you can do it using magic state distillation, as I um, mentioned earlier. And so you might apply a cost of one to magic state gates, sorry, T gates. Um, so the nice thing about this gate set is that it has a kind of nice uh, number theoretic representation that everything that's generated by this group um, can be represented in a particular way. And this was first exploited by Kalichnikov, Maslov in Moscow uh, in 2013. So you can see we've jumped ahead a few years. So they considered the single qubit Glyphid plus T gate set. And they showed that any, any unitary that could be realized exactly with some sequence of single qubit Clifford plus Ts, they could efficiently compute that circuit, the optimal circuit. And that the, um, oh yeah, I haven't put the, the cost here, but the cost would be you know, log one over epsilon and some constant outside the front. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting mistaken. There's no epsilon because this is exact synthesis. So, um, yeah, they could efficiently compute the circuit which realizes this unitary, the optimal one. And the way the proof works is it uses a ring over one over square root of two and i. So all of those matrices that I showed you on the previous slide can be written as some kind of product and sum of um, these numbers. And uh, yeah, so they use those kind of number theoretic techniques. And the key things to realize here, the kind of limitation, the pros and strengths of this work, if you suppose, if you um, suppose uh, that it only concerns single qubit gates. It's for exact synthesis. So uh, there's no like log one over epsilon relations to the cost. It's just, if you can exactly do something, this is how much it costs. Uh, it's efficient and it's optimal. So that previous work only concerned uh, single qubit gates. Later on by Kalichnikov, Gosset, uh, Rousseau and Mosca, it was extended to multi-qubit circuits. So they considered any n qubit Clifford plus T gate set. And they asked if the unitary could be exactly synthesized, uh, what, how would you find out what that exact circuit was, what that decomposition was? And so they showed that you could uh, compute a circuit achieving the optimal t-count, but the time, the runtime is not great. So the runtime of the classical algorithm that finds the optimal t-count scales, it's polynomial in some variables, but it scales exponentially in the number of qubits and the cost of the circuit. And so the reason why there's a dependence on the cost of the circuit is that it's kind of searching through a tree, checking many different possible combinations and seeing if any of them give the right solution. And again, it kind of uses this description in terms of rings. So um, for this work, they're looking at any number of qubits. And again, it's exact synthesis. So there are no epsilons lurking around on this slide, but it's inefficient. It's inefficient in the number of, in the size of the, um, it's inefficient in the number of qubits and it's, it's inefficient in the t-count of the circuit, but it is optimal. Okay, so the, the focus or the kind of bias that I'm pushing this presentation towards are uh, questions about inexact synthesis when you want to approximate um, some particular unitary that maybe you can't exactly synthesize using your gate set. Uh, 
And so there was some progress on this by Ross and Selinger in 2016. So they considered single qubit Clifford plus Seagate, but where the target unitary was not necessarily one that you could exactly synthesize, you had to approximate it, but it was just some rotation about the z-axis. So some e to the i theta Pauli z. And um, what they showed is that for any desired precision epsilon, you can always find some approximation of u, which they call v, which is close to the target. And the exact cost of implementing v is going to be upper bounded by um, four times the log of one over epsilon plus some log log factors. OK, so the important thing to realize here is this is optimal scaling because it has the exponent is equal to one. It's just log one over epsilon. So uh, this is kind of even more constrained than single qubit synthesis because it's only looking at single qubit z-axis rotations, although you can build almost everything you need out of those. Uh, it, it's, you know, there are epsilons on this slide, so it's inexact synthesis. It's optimal under some mild number theoretic assumptions and it's efficient. So these are kind of quite theoretical results, but also it's practically a very, very good compiler. So you can go online to um, Peter Selinger's website, I believe it is, and download this command line tool called GridSynth, and it runs effectively instantly and gives you the decomposition in terms of Clifford plus T-gates that you want for some rotation. And practically what you find is that it means hundreds of T-gates, which may sound like a lot, but it's, I guess it's not compared to what you've got with Solid Baker Tayev. So implementations of Solovigate Kataev that also try to solve the same problem led to tens of thousands of gates. So this is why it's really a renaissance in, in quantum compiling, because we see this, at this point in the field, we see that you could really go from tens of thousands of gates to hundreds of gates by focusing on Clifford plus two. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> lots of interesting questions were kind of answered in this renaissance period but it still left open a lot of stuff. So we still need good heuristics uh, for solving many qubit synthesis problems. So at some point, even Solovega type is gonna become impractical to multiply matrices together. And so we have to just hope for practical optimal or practical close to optimal solutions. We can ask if there are specific tasks, are there specific uh, compilers that work for those tasks? So here we're kind of, getting close to territory of algorithm design. Um, and so I'm specifically going to talk about Hamiltonian, solution, um, Hamiltonian simulation later on in this talk. Another question is, what are the benefits of ancillary measurements? So almost everything I talk about today will just be on unitary synthesis, where you try to compose a sequence of unitaries together to get some target unitary. And um, it's known that you can do better using ancillary measurements, but I won't talk about any of that today to try and keep things um, concise. But what I will talk about is what are the benefits of randomness? So that's going to be the remainder of this talk, given that everything that we've talked about previously is just asking how well can you synthesize a unitary from a sequence of unitaries. So before I start telling you about results in the area of random compiling, we've got to ask, how do we measure noise in random compilers? How do we make sense of what, what the error is between a unitary and something that isn't really a unitary anymore? An ensemble of unitaries. And the way that I uh, kind of want to start kick this off is by talking about how we measure noise in terms of states. So a very well-known metric is if I've got some target state psi and some approximation of that, let's say di one, you might measure the fidelity and then say that the noise is one minus the fidelity. And so if you kind of geometrically think about what the fidelity means, it's kind of like the distance between psi and thi if you project onto uh, the z-axis or some axis that is kind of going through psi. In contrast, uh, another metric, uh, which is the one that I'm really going to focus on more, is the one-norm error. So the one-norm error uses the, the Shatton one-norm. So the Shatton one-norm of an operator is just where you kind of take the operator m, multiply it by m dagger square root and trace. Alternatively, you can think about it as being, let's just take the uh, spectrum, the um, you know, the eigenvalues of m and sum up for the absolute value of the eigenvalues. Okay, so that's what the one norm is. And the one norm error is just what you get if you take two states, take the density matrix and subtract them from each other, and then take the one norm. And so geometrically, at least for a single qubit, what you see is that the one norm error really kind of corresponds to the Euclidean distance between two points. And it's obvious by looking at these two pictures that this distance is much longer than this one. 
And you can check that for pure states, this thing is going to be like the square root of the error for the infidelity. And taking the square root of a small number, you'll end up with a larger number. And so the one norm error is larger than the fidelity. But the case that I want to make is that it's actually the relevant thing in many cases. So for instance, if we measure some observable or at the end of our computation, we just measure some, you know, we measure some qubit, then the, uh, I guess one thing that you might be interested in is what's the probability of getting two different uh, outcomes, like say outcome plus or outcome minus if you measure the X operator for psi relative to the approximation. And what you can show is that the error in the different, in the probability distribution that you have is upper bounded by the one norm error between the states. It's not related to the fidelity. The fidelity does not tell you anything about the uh, fluctuations in probabilities in, in the output of your computation. Um, it only tells you something about those kind of fluctuations in probabilities insofar as when you know the fidelity, you can drive a one norm bound. So really this is telling you that this is the, the quantity of interest for um, bounding certain, you know, bounding how likely it is that the computer gives a result different from the result it should be giving you. Okay, so if we have two uh, states that have some uh, fidelity with respect to psi, it's pretty clear actually that if you mix between those two states, so for instance, we say that with probability 50% we choose phi one and probably 50% we choose phi two, then we end up with a mixed state row, which has the same fidelity as all of the pure states have with respect to psi, but a much, much um, lower one norm. So in fact, the one norm of rho is now similar to uh, the fidelity of these two objects. It's quadratically suppressed. So by mixing over pure states, at least with respect to the one norm error, you get a free uh, quadratic suppression of errors. And that's what we want to explore. Um, so just to give you ah, okay, one more example in terms of states. So if we're measuring the X operator here and we consider psi one rho and psi two, we'll see that rho will have exactly the right expectation value as it's just the same expectation value as um, psi gives you. Phi one massively underestimates the expectation value of this observable and psi two massively overestimates it. So for a random compiling problem, um, our analog of density matrices are gonna be channels. So given some target unitary V and some target precision epsilon, we're gonna look for distributions, probability, probability distributions of unitaries. And we're gonna random, we're kind of gonna mix over all of those different unitaries to make a channel. And we're gonna ask that the channel is close to the unitary channel um, up to some precision epsilon. And we're gonna try and minimize the cost. The cost is just gonna be, Either uh, you could either set it to be the maximum cost of each one of the possible unit trees that you implement or the average cost. In fact, for all of the results that I present, these two things are equal, but it would be interesting to um, look at just the average cost maybe in the future. So I haven't told you what this distance metric is yet. So the natural distance, met the natural distance metric, the kind of analog for channels of the one norm is the diamond norm. So the diamond norm is kind of an induced one norm. So you just maximize over all row um, over the kind of uh, difference of the two channels, take the one norm on the numerator and then divide by the one norm of the import operator on the bottom. And there's this tensor with the identity to stabilize the norm to ensure that when you compose a sequence of channels, the diamond norm adds in a, um, behaves in a way that's additive. So this is the natural extension of the one norm for states. It's the relevant thing that you want to bound to tell you something interesting about measurement expectation values. And one can hope that in a similar way to what we saw for states, you get a kind of free quadratic error suppression, that you get a free quadratic error suppression for uh, the diamond norm as well. Okay, so now we're gonna to transition to actually talking about concrete results in this direction. So the first thing that I'm gonna tell you about is some work that actually I was sat on for months and then Matt Hastings posted something very similar. So I quickly put my uh, paper on the archive, which was um, very similar, but had some details that were missing in Hastings work. So. I just wanted to flag up that he also has a paper on this similar topic. Uh, my one is, uh, the reference is here. I'll just dive straight into telling you what it, what it tells us. So what it tells us is that um, assuming some black box compiler, you don't have to know how it works, some black box compiler that solves um, the unitary synthesis problem for any cost model, or any, uh, any gate set, then there exists some mixture of those different unitaries such that the diamond norm error of the channel 
um, that you've got and the target unit tree is less than or equal to some constant factor epsilon squared. And the cost of implementing the channel uh, is less than or equal to the same kind of cost that you would get from the, well, the promise function that you get for the unitary synthesis. So basically the cost has not gone up and the error has gone down. So this constant prefactor is maybe a little bit loose. And in fact, if you specialize just to look at single qubit axial kind of Z rotations, then the assumptions can be relaxed and I can tighten um, these numbers up. But I'm just gonna use this general theorem for now. Okay, so uh, the kind of top theorem, the one that I already covered on the previous slide tells you that for the same cost with a randomized channel, you can get better error suppression. So you can trade that over. You can say, how about I uh, use my randomized algorithm to go for um, the same error, but instead lower the cost. So you can do this simply by uh, using the promise that you've got on the cost of the unit tree, setting uh, epsilon to be kind of, uh, setting 10 epsilon squared to be equal to some kind of delta and rearranging things. And then what you find once you've kind of rearranged what the cost is for this channel to get the same precision as a unitary compiler would get is that you've got the same cost for unitary synthesis f of epsilon with a prefactor c to the power of gamma. So c is this kind of like slightly ugly looking function here, but as epsilon goes to zero, this constant is just equal to one half. So that tells you that the resource saving is one half to the power of gamma relative to the cost that you would have had to pay if you were just using unitary synthesis. So let's look at that for some examples. So we're saying that the resource saving in terms of cost is two to the power of gamma. So for the Ross Selinger style of single qubit synthesis for Clifford plus T gates, they had this optimal uh, scaling of gamma equals one. So the resource saving is two. So we can actually look at some explicit examples. So if you want to do a single qubit rotation with a precision that's 10 to the minus 10, then the unitary cost would be 300 T gates, but for random compiling, it'd be 165 or less. So I say or less because these are rigorous bounds and actually if you numerically check these things, you could get something much tighter. Okay, so it depends on gamma. What else do we know? What other gamma values do we know? Well, we know that if we, for example, had to use Oliver Kataev because we were doing some multi-qubit synthesis problem and we didn't, you know, we couldn't use the ross Selinger algorithm and we, it was impractical to use the optimal ones then we would have gamma is equal to 3.97. So now the resource saving is two to the power of 3.97, which is 15.7. So this is a much, much larger resource saving. Um, and yeah, so all I'm, I'm kind of highlighting here is that the, the amount of resource saving depends on the gamma in the black box. The, the least you're ever gonna get is two X, but that's only for one limited case. More generally, we could be looking at savings that are as large as uh, over order of magnitude. Okay, so I'm gonna roughly sketch how the algorithm works without giving too many details. So it's got this black box. And what it does with the black box is it's got some target unitary that we want to implement, which is the red dot here. But we call the black box several times. In fact, only a polynomial number of times in the, yeah. Um, this gives us a bunch of green points, right? So these are things that we know how to synthesize unitarily. And they're all close to the red one. And we get enough of these points that we surround the red point. So these are all unitaries, but for any unitary, I can think about it as being e to the i h t. So I can lift it to ask what the relevant Hamiltonian is that generates that unitary. And the reason to do that is that then this is really like a linear space, right? I can add Hamiltonians together and I get another Hamiltonian. And when I say that I've surrounded the point, what I really mean is that the target Hamiltonian sits in a convex hull of all of the Hamiltonians that I know how to implement. So because it sits in the, in the convex hull of all of those points, I can find a set of PJs such that the target Hamiltonian can be written as a sum of uh, you know, the weightings of the things that I know how to realize using my unitary compiler. So these PJs now are precisely the probabilities that we will now use to, uh, you know, these are the probabilities that we, we use to sample which unitary to implement. So here, for example, we'd have three different probabilities and we say, you know, with probability P1, I choose to implement the unitary E to the I um, H1. Okay, so I won't go through the proof details, but this is kind of uh, maybe gives you an idea for what the algorithm is doing. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some work that came after the uh, 
work that I just presented that was by the group in Maryland, so Charles, Ostrander and Sue. And I suppose one thing that's different here is that uh, I guess we're, we're almost kind of in quantum algorithm territory now because they're saying for a specific problem, for a specific uh, task, what's the best that we can do, but they're gonna use some of these randomization ideas. So they look at Hamiltonian simulation. So in Hamiltonian simulation, you've got some fixed Hamiltonian. So I'm gonna write it as sum over CJ, HJ. We're just gonna normalize each of these HJs. And if you like, you can think about them as being Pauli operators. They'll often be Pauli operators, but other, other decompositions are available. And we can always pull a phase in so the CJs are um, positive constants. So given such a Hamiltonian, you want to implement the unit tree. <coughs> Sorry, sore throat. Implement the unit tree e to the i h t for some time t. And we assume that the native gate set is built out of exponentials of i to the h j for some tau where you can choose tau to be whatever you want. So in some sense, the Hamiltonian is also giving you a description of what your gate set is that you're going to use. So in the case where these HJs are Pauli operators, these things are just going to be Clifford equivalent to um, some Z rotation. So this cost model can always be reduced down to the T gate cost model by just multiplying by the Ross Selinger overhead, for example. OK, so how can randomization be useful for Hamiltonian simulation? So first, we've got to kind of pick out a unitary way of solving the problem. And the age old solution is the Trotter Suzuki product formula. So the simplest such formula is the first order formula up here in the top right. So here you just divide the unitary up into R trotter steps. So uh, here we've got R on the outside and each individual trotter step is just, uh, yeah, here's a typo. So this product over um, J is meant to be outside the exponential. So you have a product over exponential I H J T divided by R. And if you repeat this R times, then in the limit of large R, you kind of get better and better approximation of the target unit tree. So for instance, if we had a Hamiltonian that was built up of these five individual terms, then we could think about an individual step as being built up of these component unit trees. And the way that I'm gonna kind of graphically notate these things is I'm gonna use color for different Hamiltonians, but I'm gonna make the width of each segment proportional to the amount of time that it runs for. So what you can see is that if the coefficient is larger, in front of one of these terms, I'm going to run it for a longer time for that particular component gate in the, in the trotter step. So that's one trotter step, but to get good accuracy, you have to do many of them. So for instance, maybe you'd have to do 10 steps and each one of those steps would look exactly the same. But when you prove what the error bands are for a trotter formula, it doesn't care what order the gates are presented in, in the Hamiltonian. And so I could take a trotter step like this and repeat it many times, or like this and repeat it many times, or like this and repeat it many times, and each one would have the same error. So what this is kind of telling us in the space of unitaries is that there's some target unitary, and there are many different solutions, many different green dots that all represent different choices of first order trotter formulas that are different permutations of each other. They all kind of come the same distance. So now one can imagine that if I take all of these points and just choose from them randomly, I end up somewhere close in kind of Hamiltonian space to the target unit tree. And then you can use something like the kind of Campbell Hastings type lemma that I was describing in the previous section. So indeed, this is what you would do in a randomized trotter approach that Charles Ostrander and Sue proposed. So uh, to contrast, if you had 10 deterministic first order steps, each one would always use the same permutation of gates. Whereas when you use the randomized approach, each individual step has the gates within it random, in a randomized order. So you can see, for instance, here in the third step, the gates are in a completely different order to in the second or the fourth step. And what they show is that the, the gate complexity, the number of gates required to get some target position epsilon depends on L to the four, T to the um, two divided by epsilon in the deterministic case. But in the randomized case, all of these exponents are improved. So the scaling with respect to the number of terms in a Hamiltonian, the time, and also the target position are all improved. So that's really good. And um, they, the paper, I don't want to give all of the theorem statements because there are many, but it, they also show how this works for higher order trotter. And they have some numerics for 1D Heisenberg chain. So here are some of the numerics that I've just pulled from the paper. So for first order, you see quite a big gap. 
but really maybe you want to go to higher order and you see that the gap actually closes when you go to higher and higher, higher orders. Um, the best approach is probably either second or fourth order. So it can, it can be useful, but um, it's not as maybe useful as the first order leads you to think. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you about some specific random compilers that we developed in my group that were targeted at the Hamiltonian simulation problem. So again, just to remind you, in the Hamiltonian simulation problem, we've got a Hamiltonian with L terms in it, with some coefficients, and all of these are normalized, and we want to approximate I to the HT, and we're going to build it up out of uh, rotations that look like uh, the exponential of one of the component Hamiltonians. But the question I want to ask is, what if L, the number of terms in the Hamiltonian, is very, very large? And in fact, we expect it to be large for lots of interesting problems, for instance, quantum chemistry problems, where L is going to scale like or to the, to the N4, where N is the number of orbitals or the number of qubits you could think of it as. So, you know, if you've got some Trotter formula, which has a complexity that's scaling like L squared, and L is scaling like N to the 4, that's telling you that things are going to be very, very bad. It's telling you that the standard Trotter approach is going to have a very large complexity. So that's the question that I was interested in. But also, I wanted to get away from this mindset that we had in the previous results that I showed you, where we were taking a black box compiler and somehow using that as an oracle to help us design uh, randomized compilers. So we're just going to kind of design things from the ground up. And the first solution we came up with, which was called QDrift. Um, so we have the Hamiltonians as stated. And I guess one important quantity of the Hamiltonian is what's the sum of the coefficients, the CJs? That kind of tells you what the size of the Hamiltonian is. And we're going to call that lambda. So what quantum drift proposes to do is that we build a probability distribution and we weight the probability distribution according to the size of each of the HJs in the Hamiltonian. And we just sample from this probability distribution and then we do the corresponding gate. So we do a gate uh, depending on what sample we have. But notice that actually none of the constants in here, like the HJ, which Pauli operator, for example, you implement depends on the sample. But none of the other constants depend on CJ, only the probability. So what this looks like graphically, so a QDRIFT simulation, and a particular instance might look like this down here, where I've got this sequence of kind of colored bars. So you can see that the blue one, let's suppose, as per our previous example, that blue corresponds to some term in the Hamiltonian with a much larger weight. You can see that each blue gate has the same duration, like each implementation of the gate has the same duration as all of the other gates, but it appears more frequently instead. So this is what QDRIFT would do and what a kind of randomized or a first order trotter approach would do. is something that looks more like this, where you vary the gate width. But in fact, um, every term in the Hamiltonian is represented L times. So this is kind of telling you that you're not going to be able to get away from the L, um, the poor scaling with L, um, because you're always implementing all of the gates many, many times. And what I was able to show is that the complexity of QDRIFT is indeed independent of L. And this was the first time that it was ever shown. And so the gate complexity depends on this number lambda, which is really telling you how big the Hamiltonian is, the time, and epsilon. The scaling with respect to the time and the epsilon isn't great compared to higher order Trotter formulas, uh, but it has the advantage of better scaling with respect to L. And I'll come back to kind of the poor scaling with respect to epsilon in a moment. Um, so, I went through a couple of example molecules that were just generated from a standard chemistry package. So like the propane, carbon dioxide, ethane, all things that were more than 40 qubit problems. And plot the black line here is the performance of QDRIFT as a function of the time that the gate is implemented for and the number of gates that are required to realize that particular unit tree. So what we can see is that at low times, the black line is much, much lower than all of the other lines. So all of these lines represent the blue ones are first order, either deterministic or randomized. So you can see the big gap between deterministic and randomized first order. And then when you go to higher order, the gap smaller, as I was telling you, had been observed previously. Um, the gap smaller, but you know, uh, there's still a gap. But there's a big gap between any of these and QDRIFT at low time. When we got to high times, actually, the higher order formulas become better than QDRIFT. And the reason for that is that they have a better scaling with respect to T and a better scaling with respect to epsilon. Um, what we're really exploiting here is the fact that we've got better scaling with respect to the number of terms in the Hamiltonian. 
which is very, very large, right? 240,000 terms in this one, for example. Um, so T equals 6,000, for example, is a, is a relevant time that you might be looking at if you were doing um, something like phase estimation and you can see at this relevant time, there's several orders of magnitude. So this is 10 to the power of uh, 12 here, and this is like 10 to the power of 17. So we're talking about five, six orders of magnitude right at the bottom and about three orders of magnitude here. So these are kind of fairly big improvements, but I'm gonna give you a bunch of, you know, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna give you a bunch of caveats. One of those caveats is that the bounds that I've used for Trotter were the same ones that they had in the Charles Ostrander two pa Sue paper, which were in terms of this big lambda number that's the largest, uh, sorry, I changed notation when we're doing these slides, this should be max CJ, it's like the largest weight in the Hamiltonian. It'd be nice to redo these bounds to be tighter using something called a commutator bound. So if I was redoing this work, you know, a few years later, then I, this is how I do it using a commutator bound. Another comment is that it works well for chemistry problems because they have this huge number of terms in a Hamiltonian, but it does not work well for spin chain Hamiltonians. And another caveat is that I want to bring us back to this point that I'm assuming the diamond norm error is the thing that you're interested in. I've argued that it should be, but maybe for some reason it's not. And indeed for phase estimation, there are some, some subtleties. So um, those are the caveats, but you know, it, it has L, it's in the, the complexity is independent of L, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I'm, I'm covering a lot of results, so I can only really uh, do this one briefly. So there was a uh, follow-up work where we were interested in asking, is there some way that we can improve the performance of Q-drift in, um, in this regime that higher order formulas do better? Or to maybe put it another way, you can think about Q-drift as almost like a kind of randomized zeroth order Trotter formula. Is there some way to build, um, from the ground up, a randomized approach that uh, has the flavor of something higher order, that has better scaling with respect to time and epsilon, even if it sacrifices something with respect to the scaling with um, L, the number of terms in the Hamiltonian. So the solution that we came up with was an algorithm that we called sparse, oops, sorry, sparse dough. And we uh, looked at the performance again for these three molecules, carbon dioxide, ethane, and propane. <coughs> okay, so on these plots, like the previous ones, lower down is better, right? The x-axis is the error bounds that we get. So everything's in terms of error bounds. And uh, sorry, the y-axis is the error bound. And this axis here, the x-axis, is logarithm of the number of gates, log base 10. So the blue line is representing sparse stone, and uh, the orange line is uh, a kind of second order trotter, first order trotter, sorry, and the green line is Q-drift. So what sparse stone does is it kind of in interpolates between Q-drift and trotter formulas. So because it's interpolating between the two, if we go to the regime where Trotter formulas definitely do better than Q-drift, then what you see is that it's basically matching the performance. If I go far off to the left, I would be in the regime where Q-drift is doing much, much better. And you would see that the blue line and the green line kind of converge towards each other. But near where the crossover is, you're seeing about an order of magnitude improvement in the error. So it does better than either of them. And what Sparsto is doing is it's taking all of the terms in the Hamiltonian, <coughs> it's taking all of the terms in the Hamiltonian, and it's kind of, um, it's saying, let's randomly select a subset of those terms and use those to implement a Trotter formula. But the number of terms that it chooses is dependent on where you are on this axis, like how you want to interpolate. So uh, in one regime, you might choose only one term from the Hamiltonian, in which case you behave like Q-drift. In the other regime, you might choose all of the terms or almost all of them, in which case it behaves very much like Trotter. But if you choose like a 10th of the terms, then it's going to behave somewhere in between the two. And that's what this regime is here. OK, so um, I suppose there were kind of two things that I've told you there. One of them was that you can use um, randomized, you can build randomized compilers using a kind of black box oracle that's a, a unitary compiler. It's a kind of very general result. Um, but then you can kind of forget about the unitary compiler and start to build things from scratch, 
And so once we built these new algorithms like QDrift and Sparsto, we no longer know um, how kind of an equivalent de-randomized thing could work. So as I said, there is no known algorithm, for example, that's completely deterministic that would uh, solve a chemistry, like a Hamiltonian simulation problem with a complexity that's completely independent of the number of terms in the Hamiltonian. So like, what would a de-randomized version of this look like? What would a particular instance look like? And would it still have the independence of the number of terms of the Hamiltonian? So I'm gonna tell you about, well, I'm gonna give you one advert and one result statement. So the advert is just for a talk that's later today at 12 o'clock UK time. And so this is work with um, student Richard and at uh, Oxford and Simon Benjamin also at Oxford. And so here is kind of a slightly different setting. We're not looking at trotter formulas for Hamiltonian simulation, but an approach called linear combination of unit trees. But we do something that's kind of similar in flavor to uh, Sparsto in the sense that we take a Hamiltonian and we kind of truncate the small terms out to try and improve the scaling with respect to the number of terms that would be in Hamiltonian. It's a kind of similar truncation strategy, but it's not randomized, which is why I'm not gonna to say too much about it now. What I will say is that one of the reasons why it's not randomized is that it just seems to be more difficult to get this quadratic resource saving that I described in the LCU setting. There's something different about LCU that I, I can't quite put into words, but when you try to kind of run through the same steps to make it randomized and prove the similar kind of results, you, you just seem can't do it, or at least I, I've been unsuccessful so far. Um, but yeah, Richard will give a, a talk on that later today. Um, So what I do want to tell you about a little bit more is this result that came out on the archive just a few weeks ago from the Caltech group. So what they asked was what happens for a specific instance of one of these randomized algorithms? For example, what happens for a single instance of QDrift? So if we kind of pull it back to the state-based picture because it's a little bit easier to think about than channels, you know, I've given you uh, an algorithm QDrift that generates a random channel which might be used to prepare some state row. Uh, if I just run it once, then I obviously I get a pure state rather than a mixed state. What's the um, diamond norm error between this state and the target state side? We expect it to be worse, but how much worse is it? So what the Caltech group were able to show is that if you take QDrift and you de-randomize it, then you have a gate complexity that is indeed independent of L. So I think this is cool, right? Because it's now a de-randomized protocol. Um, it's, it's giving you a specific unitary. I guess you have to pick it randomly, but once you've chosen it once, you know that that unitary has a diamond norm error that's um, less, than error, le less than epsilon with respect to the target. And the gate complexity scales like n t squared lambda squared over epsilon squared. So, you know, this general philosophy about um, quadratically suppressing errors kind of tells us what well, you we expect worse scaling with respect to epsilon. But I suppose something that is a bit of a surprise is that there's an N here as well. So the, the scaling does actually also get worse with respect to the number of qubits in the circuit, but there's no L here, right? So that it is the first time that this has been observed. Now, I should say that um, this scaling here is for the diamond norm error of the unitary with the, of the, uh, a single instance of a randomly sampled unitary with respect to the target unitary. They were actually able to get rid of this N in um, a more specialized context where they say, if I'm interested not in how good the unitary is, but how good um, I can prepare a particular state. So if you say, if I um, randomly choose a unitary and apply it to some state, which is maybe also randomly chosen and compare it to uh, what I would have got with the target unitary, then this N here disappears. There's also several other results in this paper. It's very, very interesting. And the proof technique uses uh, matrix martingales. Okay, so that was my um, kind of history of randomized compiling. So I've got a, a few minutes just to give you some outlook before we hit to the questions. And so I guess one thing that I'd first like to highlight is that uh, there's not much that's been done in terms of software implementation and experimentation of different randomized protocols, especially with respect to multi-qubit circuits. So everything I've told you about has been kind of pen and paper proofs. But so I think there's a, a lot of scope here to kind of really look at what happens. In particular, although I've not really touched on it, 
you can you can kind of design these things or refine them to be better than I've described using convex optimization techniques. So you can kind of um, try to minimize certain norms and improve the performance. And this work has not been done. Um, another key question is understanding the role of randomness in some cases like phase estimation. Well, we're not interested in the error of a particular unit tree, but the error in the energy es estimate. Okay, and something very subtle happens here that means that maybe the diamond norm is not well, you have to be careful. Okay, so there's there are some questions about um, you know the details of what noise models are the best way of thinking about what particular tasks. There's randomness in post trotter, e.g., LCU circuits. So as I kind of alluded, um, all of the randomized algorithms that I'm kind of aware of are in the trotterized setting, or just a purely black box setting. And then the other question, which I think ties into what the hope is for getting something that's like a higher order version of these randomized approaches, something that has better scaling with respect to various parameters, is um, how can we go beyond IID probability distribution? So QDrift was really just pick a gate sample, pick a gate sample. And then Sparsto was even still kind of slightly IID because it was dividing things into blocks that were individually IID sampled. Um, even though within each block, there was some correlation between what gates were happening. Okay, so that's everything from me. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Great, thanks very much for that talk, Errol. That's very interesting indeed. Uh, thanks, um, Ross. We, we have a few questions from mm -hmm. Slack. Uh, the first one's from uh, Alec Edgington, which is a question which is quite similar to my own. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, could you explain a bit more this uh, this thing you alluded to near the beginning about constructing the convex hull of the unitary that you wanted? So, uh, in particular, um, yeah, yeah, I can. Alec asks, how can you solve for the PJ when you don't know the target H, but you only have a black box? Oh, you don't have to know the target H. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm saying that you do know, so the target unitary you know, and then you just say, um, you just basically write down a H that would give you that unitary, right? So you can take the logarithm basically of the unitary. So taking the logarithm of the unitary will give you this particular. And then um, this H lives in some dimensional space, some linear space, yeah? Is that, um, so, when you run the, the black box compiler once, you get a single point in this space, yeah? So say, um, so let me try and give you, so can you see my bias pointer? I was kind of assuming throughout that you could. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good, right. So what you do is, let's say this is the target and you ran the, block back, the black box compiler and you got this answer here, right? So if I run it again, if it's a deterministic compiler, it will give me the same point. So what we do actually is that once we've got this answer, we then say, I'm going to construct a new target. And the new target is over here somewhere. Yeah, it's not the same target. So when I um, set that as the new target, I get the answer H2. And the reason I get H2 is I can't get H1 anymore because it's too far away. So now I've got H1 and H2. Yeah. Now the points does not sit in the convex hull of these two points. So I need to call the black box again. So what I do is I draw a line between these two points. I kind of extrapolate out to the other side. And I say, here's my new target somewhere over here. Find me a unitary that's close to this one. Well, it can't be H1 and H2 anymore because they're too far away. So it snaps into H3. And what you can show is that if you repeat this process, you'll eventually get um, a set of points that contains the target. And this process of finding the new targets, is that stochastic or you have a deterministic way to work out where that, that next unitary should be? Um, it's deterministic, yeah. Yeah, so this whole, this, this whole, this process here, these three steps, they're all deterministic, assuming that the black box is deterministic, right? So you set a target, you get an answer from the black box, you use that to form a new target, you get a new answer from the black box, you repeat this process, it must terminate. And then from this set of points, you determine a probability distribution, right? So this is almost something you would do kind of offline before you run the device. You build the probability distribution. And then, you know, this probability distribution would kind of go into your code. And now it would say, 
every time you run the quantum computer, sample from this probability distribution, and with this probability, you know, do this unit tree. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very clear. Thanks very much. I think uh, the next question is from Alex Kissinger, and he asks for random compiling of generic unit trees as opposed to Hamiltonians. Can you get any advantage by looking at the specific synthesis algorithm rather right, than so, the white box? <clears throat> yeah, I think I missed the important bit of that question. So rather than what was the bit before, rather than? I could maybe rather than um, randomly compiling unit trees for ha Hamiltonian simulation, or if you just, sorry, let me try to say that again. Suppose you're not doing Hamiltonian simulation, but you're just compiling for an arbitrary unit tree, but you know the synthesis algorithm. Now, in this situation, can randomized methods that you use for the Hamiltonians be helpful? Okay, so um, randomization is all about replacing the epsilon with epsilon squared, right? So it has to be a um, it has to be a setting where uh, the synthesis algorithm that you're talking about is trying to approximate something. If you're talking about exact synthesis, so you know you've got some Boolean function and you want to build it out of Toffee gates or build it out of Clifford plus T gates exactly, then um, randomization won't help you. Yeah, so maybe I could have been clear at the beginning that almost everything that I'm talking about is inexact synthesis. But um, assuming that it's an inexact synthesis problem, you should always be able to use this approach. Assuming, um, yeah, yeah, you should always be able to use this approach. There'll be some kind of, there will be some um, complexity that depends on like the size of this space that I'm describing, the size of the, the space of the number of Hamiltonians. I think maybe I think the best possible application of these randomized techniques, or even uh, some of the unused, uh, unexplored applications of solid Vegetaev are not for problems where you say, here's a hundred qubits, and I want to um, just use some, find some way of synthesizing it that's maybe very, very far from optimal. Yeah, um, but when you break it down into chunks that you can maybe handle uh, with some more hope of kind of solving them optimally, so maybe like 10 qubit chunks, and each one of the 10 qubit chunks, then you know that you can, for instance, do things like solid a tire because it's a small enough system that you can multiply matrices together, yeah? But also this space that I'm describing here, where I've got these points H1, H2, H3, like the dimension of that space isn't too large, so it doesn't become too unwieldy either. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about breaking things down into manageable chunks. Each sub chunk is kind of as close to optimally solved as possible. Okay, thanks. And uh, I think we have time for one more question before the next talk starts. So we'll go to Ling Ling Lao, who's trying to bring us a bit closer to the current hardware and asks, how do these randomization techniques work with hardware or device errors? Yeah, um, I guess that's also something that I haven't uh, explored in detail, but you could, um, I guess I was emphasizing either the uniform cost model or a cost model that was like assigning unit costs to T gates and no cost to Clifford gates. But if you're looking at um, near term hardware, for example, then you might assign a different cost model, right? Where a two qubit gate has unit cost and a one qubit gate has zero cost. And then if you had some deterministic synthesis algorithm that worked well with respect to that cost model, then again, you could use this black box approach and try to come up with something that's randomized that does better. Okay, and so since that was a very quick answer, I'm going to add a little twist on, on the question saying that just to ask if you looked at any other metrics other than just count metrics. Like, so for example, in our compiler work, we think all the time about depth rather than gate count. Depth. Um, hmm. Well, um, I think maybe couldn't depth be rewritten as a cost metric anyway, right? So yeah. So my question is, did you did you actually look at, at that metric or, or any? No, other? I didn't. No, I didn't. But the way I would do handle it is maybe say that like um, there's one unit tree in the gate set which corresponds to a single qubit unit tree everywhere, and that has cost one. And then there's another unit tree which is also like all possible depth one circuits, and that has cost one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So depth can also be expressed as one of these cost metrics, but it requires you to 
kind of describe the um, generating gate set in a in a way such that everything is step one. Okay, um, I think there are no more questions in the Slack. So this seems like an ideal time for us to end the end the talk. So thank you very much, Earl, for your, your lecture. Thank you, Ross. It was great. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. And uh, I guess we can all give a round of applause.